one day when i was in college in pakistan uh, i went to a library and turned out to be uh, the us information service they had a library and i found this book called the coil of life it was about dna and i was fascinated with it and i got stuck with dna i am from pakistan and i came here in 1975 primarily to train in neurology and to do research in disorders that have no treatment no cure and at that time they had no known cause so in neurology you have many many such disorders especially in an area of neurology called neuromuscular medicine where the muscles and nerves and parts of the central nervous system are involved so i set about to train in newark new jersey in the college of medicine and dentistry now it's called the university of medicine and dentistry where i completed my residency under the chairmanship of dr stuart cook who was a renowned researcher in multiple sclerosis and other immune disorders and then i went on to do a fellowship at hospital for special surgery in manhattan which is one of the premier institutions in orthopedics and rheumatology but also in rheumatological and orthopedic neurology where i trained under peter tesaris who was a researcher in motor unit morphology and histochemistry and had trained under king engel at the national institutes of health and there i became an mda fellow muscular dystrophy association fellow because we had a muscular dystrophy clinic as well as um, a laboratory for looking at muscle histochemistry but the muscle histochemistry in this country and ac- across the globe was pioneered by king engel who was at that time at the national institutes of health and so my next uh, stop was to go to the national institutes of health and work with him i learned how to do clinical trials some of them were wild clinical trials but uh, very innovative in a lot of neurological diseases but especially in amyotrophic lateral sclerosis i also learned histochemistry of muscle and nerve because he had pioneered those um that approach of looking at uh, fresh frozen samples where you could see the histochemistry and one of the stains that is still used uh, modified trichrome stain was developed by him 50 some years ago so when he moved to university of southern california he asked me to accompany him i had offers at other places uh, including sweden to do electromyography which i had learned at the hospital for special surgery but i decided to go with king angle to university of southern california as a junior faculty member where i was charged to do research and i chose initially to do research on lipid metabolism of muscle and uh, we had some remarkable successes in treating people who were severely ill with lipid uh, disorders of muscle some were quite spectacular actually one particular one we i remember distinctly was a young man who was had been flown in from europe who uh, had uh, who was on a ventilator because of the severity of the disease and by changing his diet uh, we were able to get him going get him extubated and 6 months later he was playing golf so um but for, because of the circumstances in the lab it became clear to me that i would have to uh do research on my own this was in collaboration with other people um and so i learned some uh, protein chemistry and i learned some tissue culture techniques from valerie escanas who was well known for her ability to grow things in a petri dish including from human tissue including schwann cells and fibroblasts and others but then i became interested in amyotrophic lateral sclerosis because what the patients that i saw had no hope and in those days even clinically there was not much that could be done to make their lives easier and at the nih uh, with king angle we have done lots and lots of exp- innovative experiments 
with treatments and none of them had been successful. So the question was that uh, what should one do? So I researched what was present in motor neurons. This is a disease that affects the motor system, the voluntary muscles that move on command. And so the command center is up in the cortex of the brain called the motor cortex. And you get planning, motor planning, and then that motor cortex sends its messages down to other neurons either in the lower part of the brain called brainstem or down into the spinal cord from which they relate to the muscles of the tongue or swallowing or eye movements or eating, chewing, movements of neck, trunk, arms, legs, breathing. So these neurons, they degenerate for no known reason. Now, at least at that time, we had no known reason. We could diagnose them electrically or by clinical history and examination, but we had not a clue as to what caused these diseases. So I spent some time researching all the neurotransmitters that impinged on motor neurons, and I came up with the idea that uh, a small molecule, a three amino acid molecule called TRH, a thyrotropin releasing hormone, was present and perhaps may have some value as a growth factor. And so with King Angle, we studied three patients. Two of them got better acutely, but not in the long run. And one of them did not. So we knew that this was, was a real effect, but it was an effect that did not last long. I realized that one could do this forever because we do not know the cause of the disease or mechanism of disease. And we did not have, we had very clever ways of diagnosing it, but no way of treating it. See, I was an MD and not a PhD at that time. Um, so I looked around to see and studied and researched in the libraries. In those days, you didn't have the internet, so you had to actually go to the library and photocopy the articles and bring them and pay money for that. To study what uh, techniques were available and were upcoming, and now we are talking into the early 80s, and I decided the most powerful techniques or technology or applications would be molecular genetics. But I had not a clue as to how molecular genetics would work in the laboratory for a disease of this kind, because it had mostly been studied in cancer and in diseases which were clearly inherited from generation to generation. So I set about to see what uh, could be done for ALS. And I found that in the literature that about 10% of cases were familial. But at that point, I realized that the genome, which was not sequenced then, but it was still known, it was 3.3 billion bases, that it was finite. But people had focused on the environment, which I reasoned was infinite because one could only look at the causes in the environment uh, of the ones that one knew. I mean, there could be any other cause that we had no, not a clue about, but in looking at the genome, it was finite, though large. So I looked around for laboratories who could train me or where I could train to learn these techniques. In the laboratory, I had some now theoretical knowledge and I knew what was needed and looked at Caltech and um, in, because I was in California and looked at UCLA, but nobody was willing to train a neurologist in their laboratory and these new sort of harebrained ideas about a disease that came late in life and did not have that many people that you could study. So I looked at elsewhere, I looked um, at other places, and uh, the problem was the same, that nobody was willing to invest into a new idea and, uh, and train somebody who had no training in molecular genetics. Till I came across a paper written by Alan Roses and uh, Margaret Perichek Vance in Muscle and Nerve. Muscle and Nerve is a very specialized journal. It's not, you know, one of the journals that is read by most people. It's read by people who do neuromuscular medicine. And I was very impressed that here was an approach that I could take 
but I had to get my foot into his laboratory and I met with him. We had breakfast and in 30 minutes he had determined that I would be the one he would uh, support in his laboratory. He was converting his laboratory from a membrane chemistry laboratory to and other, other types of approaches to molecular genetics. So it was one of the earliest laboratories that were being converted, a neurology laboratory, to molecular genetics. So I pursued this with him over the telephone. And finally he said that there was a spot that he could fit me into, which was to do electromyography at the VA, which would support my salary. Uh, and the rest of the days I could work in the laboratory, but he would not give me any salary for it. So it would have to be earned through doing electromyography on veterans at the VA hospital in Durham, North Carolina. Which so I did for two days a week, two long days, and the other four days I spent in the laboratory learning all these new techniques which were coming on board at that time. There was no PCR at that time. Uh, they were just gels and stuff that one had to do or phages that one had to isolate and purify and ligate, uh, you know, and so forth. So everything was new, f not only for me, but for the whole field. So I learned a lot of things. I sp uh, so, and I did this for a year. I had, my salary was reduced in half. My wife had to sacrifice because she was pursuing her master's degree at UCLA where she worked as a neurology nurse and she agreed to transfer with me which was obviously a big sacrifice for her at that time. But later on she was able to obtain her master's with flying colors from University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And she worked at, at Duke Medical Center as a first as a nurse on the neurology floor and then as a critical care nurse in the neurointensive care unit. She supported my work all through. Then uh, when we came here, she we, um, adopted a child. So um, she took off for some years to, to make sure that the child had, our daughter had a great upbringing, which she, she has. And then she joined me in the laboratory and has done marvelous work with all the families, spending hours and hours and hours, even though she's part-time, she works virtually full-time to talk to these patients, talk to their families, tell them about the research, recruit them into the research. And um, I think with her personality and with her uh, background in nursing, uh, she has been a superb companion in this journey. A year after my arrival, I was able to obtain an NIH training grant, which is called Teacher Investigator Development Award at that time, a five-year grant in which they assure your salary and I'll give you 80, 90% of your time to do research and about 10 to 20% of the time in the clinic or in the hospital taking care of patients. So I did that for five or so years, seven years actually. And uh, total time I spent there and uh, was able to obtain new grants. And uh, then an opening came up here at Northwestern and Alan Roses, who has since died, 2017, he passed away said I should go and apply to this position, which I did. And about at that, that time, my efforts of the last seven years came to fruition that we were able to find the first cause ever in 120 years or so uh, for ALS. Also, towards this time, when I was at Duke, towards the end of my stay there, uh, uh, other neurology colleagues got interested in this process, especially at the MGH, and they came down to asked for collaboration to which we agreed. Um, however, we had already found the location of one of the genes on chromosome 21. And I had determined that it was SOD1 or superoxide dismutase 1. Now that gene was, that protein actually was worked on and discovered by Fridovich who was still worked at Duke. And so I went to see him. He was not familiar with molecular genetics, but he was a good chemist. But he had nothing to offer in terms of how to prove that this was indeed the gene because we had discovered markers very close to it. And so we could say that this was the most likely gene to be the cause. But in the meantime, I had contacted Dr. Hallowell, who was from England, 
And he was kind enough to send me a print of, of his chapter, which most people didn't know about. There was no internet. So he had sequenced it, chemically sequenced the whole gene, the whole gene for SOD1. So I knew exactly how what one we could sequence. There is a great deal of excitement and hope within the medical community tonight. A Chicago researcher has made a stunning discovery that may change the course of a deadly disease called neurologist has made the first breakthrough in ALS research in more than 100 years. Chicago has made an important discovery, the first big breakthrough in the disease in more than 120 years. Yet in a century-long quest for the cause of a crippling, always fatal disease, right here in Chicago. Profound new knowledge about the cause of ALS and open many possibilities for treatment. It's like uh, David and Goliath. We haven't slain Goliath, uh, but we certainly feel like a David who has been introduced to the slingshot. A major breakthrough in ALS research in 100 years. The first one two years ago was also made by Dr. Sadiq. Floyd, the work's gonna be published tomorrow in the journal Nature, and it could also have implications for Parkinson's disease, other kinds of ALS, and even post-polio syndromes, neuromuscular diseases. Very important finding. This had such a high impact because now the new generation of physician scientists don't know that ALS not only is a terrible disease, but nothing was known about it. It was a complete black box till this discovery and then, of course, eventual discovery by other people of other genes. We were able to publish the gene soon after we came here, its location, and thereafter, having finally sequenced it uh, to show and publish it in a high-profile journal, Nature, and prior to that in New England Journal of Medicine, which got us a lot of international recognition because this was the first time ever a neurodegenerative disease, which was considered sporadic uh, cause had been found. And that was a anniversary also of Crick and Watson discovery in 1953 of the double helix. But we knew that this was now not the only cause for ALS. We wrote that in our first paper, and soon thereafter, we were able to find the second gene, which was in juvenile cases in children. This opened up an entire, you can say, industry for finding genes for ALS and related disorders. And uh, people were able to garner those who had been riding on our coattails, lots and lots of funds um, to do so. Uh, I have been funded now with the NIH or the DOD, Department of Defense or um, CDC since uh, 1985. Uh, I'm very grateful for their support. But I was also funded when I came here through the Les Turner ALS Foundation and to some extent by the ALS Association and the Muscular Dystrophy Association. Molecular genetics was completely new to Northwestern and so was neurogenetics for the entire Chicagoland area. It was also new to the Institutional Review Board here, so they had to be educated over a long period of time to understand the hazards of doing genetic research and the protections needed. At that time, the Congress had not passed the bill for protections again about genetic information. So there was a long struggle, you can say, in terms of establishing a new laboratory for the first time in my life, as well as educating my colleagues here about the value of what we were doing. We made the first animal model for this disease, which is still the most useful and used animal model, and we placed it in Jackson Laboratory so any researcher in the world could acquire it. What surprised me was that our colleagues had patented that animal without telling us. So that was very disappointing. Uh, and I think that sort of speaks about that was uh, there were there were many other such uh, disappointments that uh, we faced uh, in terms of dealing with uh, the culture of science. But uh, that has not deterred us because this is human nature, and one has to continue to the work one can do. Uh, our philosophy has been to do what others are not doing or cannot do. And uh, we were able to, for the first time, completely have a seamless connection between clinic and laboratory. And so the clinic, not only here at Northwestern, but across the country and the world, became linked to our laboratory. So we were able to follow hundreds of families with different kinds of diseases and obtain information about them from all across the globe. 
had never been done with ALS or related diseases. So this created for us a huge uh, potential resource. We also embarked on an autopsy program here of ALS patients, which also became one of the larger programs. And through it, we were able to establish a common pathology in all of ALS. Based upon a couple of genes that we discovered, new genes, and they had to do with the protein cycling mechanism. That was the first time a protein cycling mechanism was discovered to be uniform based on pathology and genetic cause. So there are two mechanisms of recycling of proteins. One is through what is called the proteasome, the ubiquitin proteasome system, in which this gene that we discovered the mutations in, ubiquitin 2, is a chaperone, sort of a chaperone for those proteins to be recycled properly, and it binds in ways that there is a barrel and there's a lid and binds to controls the lid. Uh, and the other system is the autophagosome lysosome system, for which there are many, many, many diseases, like 50 diseases that we know of the lysosome in children. So now we had evidence for both systems. And interestingly, the discovery of both the systems have been awarded the Nobel Prize. So it's a very important system in every cell of the body, but certainly in the nervous system and neurological diseases. So here we had the first etiological, that is the mechanism sorry, the causation of disease and a possible mechanism of disease. The gene was being mapped by Sanger. I traveled to England and talked to people at the Sanger Institute who were very nice to me, but the whole gene for that region had not been sequenced. And then finally, they were repositioning the genes. You know, this was an ongoing work. And they finally put the gene called ubiquilin 2, ubiquilin 2, in that region where we had found the location of the gene. Previously, it had been at the tip of the chromosome. And I said, this is it, because it is a key factor in recycling of proteins. And the pathology of ALS is an aggregation of proteins that have not been recycled. So this was the first link between cause and mechanism of disease and pathology of disease. This is a huge key to the whole problem, not only of people who have the mutation, which is very rare, but everybody with ALS, or virtually everybody. So now we have uh, potential new therapies for ALS uh, that we are pursuing. And for example, we, a year ago or two, we were able to genetically correct using gene editing the animal model we had made in 1994. So now we are poised to be able to use genetic applications, such as using genes to express or to edit through viruses and in other ways. And we have discovered targets that would allow us to do that. So I think for me now is to, dependent upon the context where I work, where this becomes possible in the shortest available time in terms of implementing actual treatment, because we have the animal models and we have the intellectual capital and we have the techniques and technologies to know how to do it. The idea is to enlarge the field and to fill in the gaps. In other words, do we do science knowing our weakness, our, our gaps in our knowledge, uh, that we don't have drugs off the shelf that we can fix this disease with, that this knowledge gap must be filled to understand the mechanism of disease, and to, to understand that, we have to say that let us work for the next generation of ALS patients so that we don't have this conversation with every generation. We know the genome, we know lots of new things, and there are lots of new things that we are doing in our laboratory which will try help us to understand how the brain changes with time, both in animals and in humans, in terms of expression of genes. I think one has to set a pattern, to set a standard, and I was fortunate enough to set that standard in my laboratory and in the clinic in terms of the highest possible treatment of patients, uh, uh, expectations uh, that that one had. We were able to create multidisciplinary clinics and we, we were able to get pulmonologists, cardiologists, physical medicine, rehab working all together. Trained people with from physical medicine, rehab, started the first fellowship program, subspecialty program. So that sort of breadth of interaction and, and uh, experience was only possible when an institution like Northwestern allowed me to have it. So I'm very grateful for that. 
there was a compulsion to do this. It was a very strong compulsion. It came from inside or outside or both, I don't know, but it was a very strong compulsion. And um, I was helpless in front of it. As I have been very optimistic, uh, nobody goes into this disease who is not optimistic because it's such a dismal disease. And people would say, you can diagnose them, but you can't treat them. But um, the, the very forced compulsion led to the first discoveries, which has made it possible for the next generation to say it can be done.